Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Margaret and Herman Sokol Science Lecture. Tonight, we are going to have the great good fortune of meeting Dr. Rita Caldwell. Dr. Caldwell is a microbiologist, educator, and internationally recognized expert on infectious diseases. Earlier this year, Dr. Caldwell assumed the newly created position of chairman of Canon U.S. Life Sciences, which was founded in December of 2002 to identify and develop life science solutions with potential applications in diagnostics and medical instrumentation. Dr. Caldwell also serves as a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland, College Park, and is on the faculty of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she will develop a new international center for the study of infectious diseases, water, and health in conjunction with colleagues from Sweden, Norway, Japan, and Bangladesh. Dr. Caldwell began her career as a professor and administrator within the University of Maryland system. She went on to become a member of the National Science Board from 1984 to 1990, founding president of the University of Maryland Biotechnology Center from 91 to 98, and director of the National Science Foundation under Presidents Clinton and Bush from 1998 to 2004. With Dr. Colwell's able leadership, the NSF budget increased by 68%. The average annual grant size grew from 90,000 to 142,000, and the foundation's funding reached the level of more than 5.3 billion. Dr. Caldwell's policy approach has enabled the agency to strengthen its core activities and establish a number of major initiatives, including several that directly benefit higher education. Our faculty in the College of Science and Mathematics who have secured funding from the National Science Foundation to support their research and programs are, I know, particularly appreciative of her leadership as director. Along with all her other responsibilities, Dr. Caldwell found time to serve as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Society for Microbiology, and Sigma Xi, a nonprofit scientific research society with a membership of more than 70,000 scientists and engineers. She has co authored or authored 16 books and more than 600 scientific publications, and has served on editorial boards of numerous scientific journals. In addition, she has held many advisory positions in the federal government, nonprofit science policy organizations, private foundations, and the international scientific research community. Her contributions have been recognized by the conferring of several prestigious awards, and she has even had a geological site in Antarctica named in recognition of her work in the polar regions. It's called the, appropriately, Caldwell Massacre. Dr. Caldwell holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Bacteriology and a Master of Science in Genetics from Purdue University and a PhD in Oceanography from the University of Washington. She stands out as one of the preeminent leaders of the United States scientific community. And we are extremely proud to have her with us at Montclair State University. Please join me in welcoming the very charming and delightful and very distinguished speaker, Dr. Rita Caldwell. Thank you very much, President Cole, and good evening to all of you. I'm very pleased to be here um, sharing with you tonight some thoughts about global infectious disease in the era of bioterrorism. And I'm going to focus on interactions of pathogens with the environment. Uh, this is sort of a clear recognition 
that we're moving beyond the old sort of reductionist or drilled down approach of viewing a pathogen, bacteria or virus or parasite in isolation. And we're now beginning to develop a much, much richer understanding of a microorganism in all of its complexity. As John Dunn might have said, no pathogen is an island entire of itself. Every pathogen is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. I purposely entitled my talk, Global Infectious Diseases in the Era of Bioterrorism, because we've come a long, long way to integrating all of the information that we gather about some organisms, and I'm going to use Vibrio cholerae, a causative agent of pandemic cholera that even today affects hundreds of thousands of people, particularly in Bangladesh, India, and Africa. The, this organism, this cholera bacterium, is a normal component of the ecosystem. An organism that can never be eradicated entirely, but only controlled. Although I can now use the word classic when describing the story of cholera, I can remember when we first discovered that it goes into a dormant stage, sort of spore-like, which the bacteria of its type weren't supposed to do. And when I proposed that about 10 years ago, the um, folks at the CDC referred to it as Colwell's ghosts. So when you have a new paradigm, it's always hard to bring it forward. Now, the connections between cholera, which is an ancient waterborne disease that goes back to the days of even pre-Egypt, and the connections between the environment and cholera provide a really nice paradigm for looking at many organisms which have a kind of multi-dimensional biography. And so having a really complete understanding of an infectious disease, whether it's cholera, hantavirus, SARS, or malaria, now reaches from countries to continents, and it enriches medicine with insights from science and engineering. Now, I'd like to discuss the global context for just a little bit. And then I'm going to move on to some specific examples of pathogens in a global environment. And I'll conclude with a case of cholera because it is very, very interesting. Now, a global context, that is, moving things from the global perspective, as I've tried to show here, frames all of the human health issues in the 21st century. This context is comprised of several realities. And these include the worldwide movement of people and goods, the new recognition that the Earth processes like climate operate in a global scale, and there's a dynamic international enterprise. We scientists now work together, whether we're in Bangladesh, Japan, or Europe, or the United States, with email, video teleconferencing. We really work as a team. And so health issues, are no longer just a subject between the patient and the physician, if they ever were. But they now encompass an individual's complex relationship with the global environment. Now, Gro Harlan Brumman, she was the director of the World Health Organization, has said it rather nicely. In the modern world, bacteria and viruses travel almost as fast as money. With globalization, a single microbial sea washes over all of humankind. And there are no health sanctuaries. Bacteria don't carry passports. They do infect anyone. Now, the graph two at the bottom shows how international travel has skyrocketed in the past half century. Almost 500 million international arrivals per year and going up. And you can see on the world map at the top where all those travelers are going. The routes circumscribing the world map 
are the most popular air routes between the continents. And if you look at the large green arrows at the right of the map, they give the percentage of increased arrivals over the mid-1990s in different locations. International arrivals, people getting off airplanes from other countries, increased in every region. But in Africa and the Middle East, they jumped by almost 50%. So our world, the world of infectious disease, the world of research, the social world, is now integrated and it's global. And these connections make very simplistic the notion that we can really eradicate a disease from the face of the planet. It just isn't going to happen. Infectious disease is a moving target. As the climate shifts, any disease with an environmental stage or, or an environmental vector like a mosquito that carries malaria is going to be affected. And as we recognize the signals from the climate models and we incorporate them into health measures, we have new opportunities for proactive rather than reactive approaches to public health. So I'm going now to turn to a very, very brief survey of just a few cases of infectious diseases in an ecological context. Ecology has immediate lessons for epidemiology. Take the mosquito that lays eggs in these very pretty North American carnivorous plants. They're called pitcher plants. Although not a disease vector, this mosquito's evolution gives us some good lessons in how vector-borne diseases can spread as climate shifts. Now, this mosquito uses the length of the day to regulate seasonal development. Now, mosquito populations have adapted to the climate of North America, from Florida to Canada. And the disease-carrying invaders, like the Asian tiger mosquito, have similarly adapted to the cold and to different lengths of the day. As spring now is coming earlier and earlier with global warming, and the growing season has lengthened over the last 50 years. The pitcher plant mosquito has adapted to shorter photo periods, especially in the northern part of the United States. In a very nice example of a documented genetic shift that's due to warming, this graph shows as the latitude increases the mosquito's genetic shift to a shorter photo period has the left axis in ours. And so this genetic shift over as short as just a five-year period is essentially evolution going on at a, break, a breakneck speed, a very rapid speed. Now, many of you will be familiar with another story. That it, it involves climate and a natural disease vector, the case of the hantavirus. Now, this was unknown in the New World in the United States until the 1993 outbreak occurred in the four corners of the United States. That's the area where Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico meet. The mortality rate of the people who were first infected with this hantavirus was 70% in the first few weeks. And the carrier turned out to be a mouse, a rodent. Biologists working at the long-term ecological research site at Sevieta, led by Terry Yates of the University of New Mexico and his team, they were able to detect the deadly virus in mouse tissue that had been archived, that had been stored, collected and stored years earlier. And some of the study sites you can see on the map in red. It was interesting. They were just studying the ecology of mice, deer mice. Now, in addition, the investigators found a link between climate and the outbreak of the disease, the hantavirus disease. And they found that very mild, very wet winters were associated with a periodic climate pattern. 
the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the El Nino event, had provided more food for the mice. And so the populations increased dramatically in 1993. Now in this graph, the black line shows the density of the mice, not the honey lice populations. The red line shows the density of mice infected with hantavirus. They're a carrier of the virus. And the green bars shows human cases. So what's the take-home message? Well, the key predictor of the disease is not the increase in the number of mice per se, but the increase in the infected mice, the red lines. So the researchers are now pursuing what's called a trophic cascade hypothesis. Well, it's a fancy name to explain the changing levels of human risk uh, for the zoonotic diseases that are associated with climate change, climate variability. And so the cascade of disease through the trophic levels of mice to humans is apparently set off by the El Nino event. Now, another example is Campylobacter. This emerged as the, as the leading cause of gastroenteritis, thyroid disease in some countries it appeared just about 25 years ago. And we didn't know of it before then. The public health interventions were focused really on foodborne transmission because it's associated with chickens. If you don't cook chickens properly, the chance of Campylobacter infection is quite high. Now, by focusing on the food and trying to improve the food handling, they did not decreased the incidence of the disease. This was, this was really a problem. In fact, as we see in the graphs on the right, there was an annual rise over the last 10 years. And also the disease has displayed a very striking and a consistent seasonal pattern. My student, Valerie Lewis, in her PhD thesis, observed a very significant correlation between the increased temperature during the spring and summer of the year, and the seasonal peak in the Campylobacter infections, the number of cases in England and in Wales. And the figures show the Campylobacter incidence by the district in England and Wales in the 1990s. At the left are the annual cases for 100,000 people, and you can see where it's very dark, it's 105 to 115 cases per 100,000 people. That's a very high incidence. At the right are the annual rates in different districts. Now, the red line shows the weekly incidence rate for children, kids, aged one through four, first four years of age. Notice how sharp that peak is for that particular age class compared to the other age classes. For example, the very light blue is the over 70 years old population. So the seasonal effect or the sharpness of those peaks becomes less pronounced for older people. And so this seasonality related to age has not been discovered before. This is a paper that's just now going to appear very shortly. Certainly, children under the age of five are a prime target for public health measures. And the bottom graph shows that males, the blue line, have a higher rate of infection than females, no matter the age group. Now, you know, some years ago, um, the University of Georgia football players proved their manhood by eating raw chicken. Well, they can move people after, so I'm not sure that was too wise a thing to do. Maybe that accounts for male incidents being greater. Well, more broadly, Campylobacter infects humans through a whole range of ecological pathways, especially in water. Recently been shown to, in fact, be associated with surface waters, particularly in the parts of England and Scotland, where there are a lot of cattle raising and lambs being raised, and sheep, for, for food. Now, another uh, disease that's very interesting is tularemia. This, this is a disease with a very complex environmental link. And the graph you see here shows an epidemic pattern 
of tularemia in Sweden. Now, I should point out that tularemia is also one of the five class A very, very dangerous potential bioterrorism agent. It's along with smallpox, anthrax, we include tularemia. It's a disease that um, can kill, but is very debilitating. And as a bioterrorism agent, it can make a lot of people very sick because it's highly transmissible. Not necessarily die, but not very, feeling very well or be able to do work or anything else. Now, the disease has been endemic, meaning it has occurred every year for the last 70 years in Sweden. In fact, in Sweden, they have more cases of tularemia in one year than we have in the United States in 10 years. Now, airborne tularemia was contracted from contaminated hay when rat populations and mice populations increased and then died off. Tularemia generally occurs throughout the Northern Hemisphere and beyond, and it's caused a million human cases over the last 70 years. And there are several different forms, species, and subgroups that are recognized. It's a plague-like disease, along with plague, which again is one of those five terrorism agents. Uh, occurs, tularemia and plague occur in a hundred different kinds of wild animals. Also in birds, insects, and humans. And so human infections are really some of the byproduct of the organism's interactions with its environment. Like cholera, a couple of tularemia forms occur in water. It's a waterborne disease. And waterborne outbreaks have resulted from contaminated drinking water. Now, one hypothesis is that tularemia is, in fact, waterborne with muskrats, rabbits, and similar animals being a reservoir in nature. What I'm trying to point out to you is that these infectious diseases are really part of our environment. European forms of tularemia are spread through a whole variety of hosts and vectors in North America. And the table gives a snapshot of some of the animals from which the organism was isolated. Hares or rabbits, voles or small mammals, contaminated hay. So tularemia in Scandinavia occurs across the floodland, in stream and tundra ecosystems. So if you're traveling through or hiking through the tundra, that is one of the potential risks that you take. And the study of the former Soviet Union showed that a whole diversity of animal vectors are associated with different forms of tularemia. Uh, mice, um, yeah, swamp uh, areas, and particularly a seasonal incidents, late autumn and winter, but occasionally in the summer. This map shows where tularemia has been found in the United States, in North America. The line marks the lowest latitude where epidemics or epizootics have been found. So the North American form, the one that we're susceptible to because it's native to the United States, Francisella tularensis, is more virulent to human beings than the European and the Asian counterparts. So that's kind of an interesting phenomenon that the tularemia bacterium in the U.S. has a greater pathogenicity for humans. We don't quite know why. Now, tularemia, interestingly, was first recognized in squirrels in San Francisco in 1911. So we've really only known about this disease for less than 100 years. And later, water transmission was established. So we're pretty sure it's a waterborne disease. And tularemia cases in the U.S. have decreased. We, we have only about a couple of hundred cases, 200 cases of a year since 1960. Before that, we had many more cases. And the recent U.S. outbreaks occurred from captive prairie dogs. So I wouldn't recommend a prairie dog as a pet. 
And we had recently a couple of outbreaks in Martha's Vineyard and a couple of pulmonary cases in South Dakota. So it becomes very difficult to determine when someone has introduced a bioterrorism agent because there's this background of infection and distribution throughout the environment. Let's take the case of cholera. From Campylobacter to hantavirus to tularemia, we're beginning to trace the connections between a pathogen and its environment. And so I'm going to turn now to some results from my own research, which I hope you might find interesting. One of the first things we discovered a couple of years ago is that, surprisingly, this bacterium has two chromosomes. Until the year 2000, it was believed that a bacterium had only one single chromosome. And we now know that this whole class of organisms, the vibrios, have two chromosomes. More than that, they have a large chromosome, and they have a small one. And the toxin genes are on the large chromosome. As you can see on the right, the large chromosome has the various toxin genes. Now, the sequencing data, we sequenced the entire genome and published that in 2000, confirmed that this bacterium is very versatile. We had proposed that it was naturally occurring in the environment, but that was considered to be um, not acceptable. Physicians insisted up until about 1985 that Vibrio cholera was only transmitted from person to person. But we now know that it's very versatile. It's found in all estuarine, riverine systems. And it has the ability to infect the human gastrointestinal tract, but I'll have a little bit more to explain why I think it does that. One of the phenomena that occurs is lateral transfer of genes. That is, one vibrio can actually share genes with another vibrio species. There's a lot of lateral transfer of genes amongst bacteria in the environment. And in fact, a few years ago, almost 10 years ago now, for the first time ever in hundreds of years, an entirely new serotype, the 0139, broke out in Madras, India, spread to Bangladesh, and has now become the second pandemic serotype of cholera. So we have seen the evolution of an entirely new pathogen in our lifetime, in the last decade. Now, bacterial viruses are another very interesting phenomenon because they play a very important role in this whole ecology of these aquatic ecosystems because the viruses can carry genes as they infect one host and move to another. And they can give rise to new toxigenic variants. That means you may have some bacteria that are fairly harmless, but they be an uninfected with a bacterial virus that carries the genes for production of toxin. And it converts them a recipient bacteria to becoming a toxigenic strain. There's something else very interesting about cholera and its interactions with the environment. The ecological relationship of cholera and planktonic copepods was first established in 1983 when my student, Dr. Anwar Huck, and I showed that Vibrio cholerae, which causes this terrible disease, cholera, attaches to live copepods. And they're found in the gut of copepods, and they're part of the natural form. Just like we humans carry in our gut, Escherichia coli, E. coli, it's part of our natural form. We have billions of these bacteria in our gut. And a good thing, too, because they produce some vitamins, and they are helpful to us. Well, for these little copepods, as you can see here, you have Thona, the Uritemra, and the Acacia. Their gut flora are the vibrios, including cholera. And now one of my students, Tanya Rollins, at the University of Maryland, is looking at the seasonality of cholera to see 
what its association with temperature and salinity is, and whether the interactions with these copepods, namely the three that I've shown you here, are associated with its seasonal abundance. Because we know that in the spring and in the fall, in countries that don't have good water treatment, like Bangladesh and in India, there's a peak in the spring and a peak again in the fall in numbers of cases. And this is related entirely to the peaks in the plankton population. And now we also have some evidence that these different serotypes, the O1 and the O139, attach differently to different copepods. And that may explain the epidemic outburst for the first time in 100 years of this new toxigenic strain. Now, another aspect of cholera, which is very interesting, is this temperature salinity interaction. In the Chesapeake Bay, the cholera bacteria are quite predominant in the middle part of the bay, and that's because the salinity is optimal for the bacteria in that area. So, all of these ecological factors, salinity, temperature of the water, the season, spring, summer, fall, all together impact and provide the holistic view of an epidemic. And so, 10 years, 50 years, or 100 years ago, we thought really only about the bacterium and the host. We didn't think about anything else. And we tried to control epidemics and eliminate pathogens, but we weren't taking into account the ecology and the environment in which these pathogens exist. Now, another very interesting aspect is that we found that it was the life stage of the, of the uh, copepod that was very important. The Vibrio colliery, you can see the peaks during the year. In the spring of the year, the, the nuclei, the young copepods, carried by far many, many more of the Vibrios. Another aspect is, is the ability of these bacteria to produce biofilm. So when you see a vessel used to collect water, as is done in Bangladesh, and you see the sort of slime build up on the, on the surfaces of glass, that's a bacterial biofilm. The bacteria produce this polysaccharidic material that provides a protective coating for them against acid, against pH changes, against different chemicals. And so it's very important, we've learned, to make sure that in the villages, where they collect water from ponds and bring them to the house, for the daily use by the families, that these vessels, these jugs, have to be cleaned out very, very well. This is a the previous study, is one done by uh, John Michelanos at Harvard University. Now, I won't go into this except to say that we've summarized all of the data and come up with some very interesting phenomena. We know that salinity, with about 15 parts per thousand, sort of estuarine salinity, is optimal for the growth of these bacteria. And here in the Chesapeake Bay are the sampling sites, and we can find occurring in the Chesapeake Bay the incidence of cholera. Now, we don't have cholera in Maryland. We don't have cholera in uh, Pennsylvania. But we did 100 years ago. 100 years ago, Washington, D.C. had yellow fever, typhoid fever, cholera, malaria. It was referred to as a miasmic swamp. Well, it's still a miasmic swamp, but for different reasons. So that, again, <coughs> The bacterium is in the environment. And so, in the Chesapeake Bay, the bacterium is there. One of my students, John Heidelberg, who now works at Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research, used gene probes and was able to demonstrate with molecular genetic evidence the incidence and the presence 
the Vibrio colony, just like the strains in Bangladesh, in the Chesapeake Bay, with the seasonal incidence. Spring has more numbers in the water and associated with plankton in the bay, and again in the fall. This is the plankton peak with which it's associated. Now, another aspect, this is just some of the data from the Chesapeake Bay showing as you go further down the bay, the salinity goes up, and the bars show the numbers of vibrios go down. So a very high saline environment is not terribly yeah, conducive to, to growth, but survival, not necessarily growth. Now, Peru offered a very interesting study for us, because in 1991, for the first time in 100 years, there was a massive, explosive epidemic. Hundreds of thousands of cases occurred in the summer months, which is in that part of the world, November, December, January, February, and March. Late fall, summer, and, um, uh, I'm sorry, early spring, summer, and late fall of the year. And it was not understood where this came from. Why did it suddenly happen? Well, it turns out that it was the time of the El Nino, the warming of the um, surface of the ocean. We were able to show that clearly the bacteria were associated with plankton, the numbers were much greater on plankton, but it was this event, the El Nino, you can see how broad the red area, which is very warm temperature, uh, along the coast of Latin America, Mexico. It was, it was a period of time, 1991, 92, 93, when the surface waters, the temperature rose significantly, and the numbers of bacteria, the cholera bacteria in the water, rose as well. And so the actual mechanism that set off this sudden explosive outbreak of cholera is still sort of a puzzle because we're not quite sure just what triggered the massive epidemic, but we know temperature and the El Nino event played, played a significant role. And the reason we know that is because the climate scientists told us there would be another El Nino in 1997 and 1998. And so we learned this in 1995, and so we began preparing for it. And we asked our colleagues in Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, in Panama, to join with us, the public health labs, and to begin sampling the environment using gene probes and molecular techniques. In September of 1997, and sure enough, we began to see increasing numbers of cholera vibrios in the water as the temperature rose. And then by about November, cases of cholera began to occur. And by December of 97, they had an epidemic, and it lasted until about May of 1998. So there, Mother Nature provided an experimental test Base for us to confirm our hypothesis of the temperature of the water and also the plankton, because we've done those studies as well, a relationship in cholera outbreaks. And so now we have a model for us to be able to predict when a cholera outbreak is going to occur. When the water temperature reaches 15 to 17 degrees, when the conductivity goes up, because that means there's a lot of calcium and other divalent ions are present. When there's a lot of rain, so that there's a dilution of a reduction in the salinity, and it allows for growth of the plankton, then we begin to get cases of cholera. And the interesting thing about this is that we can measure sea surface temperature by satellite. And we've been doing this now for the last 10 years. And we can now show unequivocally that year after year, measuring the temperature by satellite imagery, we can predict when cases of cholera are going to go up in Bangladesh. 
And I sort of find it amazing that, you know, a couple of miles out, you've got a satellite rotating around the Earth, taking pictures of the Bay of Bengal, and you have physicians literally counting feet as the patients come in, and being able to correlate the numbers of cases of cholera with the rise in the sea surface temperature. So this gives us a wonderful tool to do global epidemiology and to predict when there's going to be an outbreak of cholera. And this was just as we showed in Peru, and I've summarized the data. You can see the cases, the bars, and you can see the water temperature. Very dramatic correlation. Now, uh, this again is water depth because the ponds in Bangladesh are the sources of water for the villagers. There's no water treatment. Now that leads me to something else I'd like to share with you. It's all well and good to do these very sophisticated studies in your students, and it's, it's fun to learn that satellites can give you this information and then molecular biology can confirm the presence of these bacteria. But how do you help the people in the villages who are dependent on the water in a pond? When you dip a cup or a glass in and you look at it, you can see things swimming. But that's the water you have to drink. Well, we did some experiments. We took simple cloth. We, we, looked at the material that the people had, the poorest of the poor. The men wore t-shirts, and the women wore saris. We found the t-shirt didn't work very well, but we found if you took the sari cloth, just a yard of it, and you folded it four to six times, it filtered out all the plankton, and 99.9% .9 of the cholera bacteria and so we did a big experiment. Three years, we had 52 villages in Bangladesh, 145,000 people. We divided it into villages who filtered and villages who did not. And we did the studies we sent to the villages who were going to filter. We had um, sort of extension agents, women, who would go out and explain once a week to the women of the village how to use the sari cloth and explain to them. Of course, it didn't take much because if you showed the women the water from the pond with things swimming and it's sort of a murky brown, and then you pass it through a sari cloth and it's fairly clear and there's nothing swimming around, the woman understands. So we, at the end of three years, we found we could reduce cholera by 50%. So that was a very simple solution. And it's one now that we are introducing in Africa. There's an outbreak right now in Rwanda. And very simple cloth filtration can be used when there is no central water supply or when the country is racked by violence and turbulence that they have to depend on a very poor source of water. But this is one way we can take the information, high technology, distill it with a scientific basis to a technique that can help the individuals. Now, the association of rainfall is another one of the factors as we show that as the monsoons occur in Bangladesh, that reduces the salinity. That's another factor in the increase in cholera. And conductivity is more divalent. Cations, you can see with the increases in the conductivity, there's increases in the number of cases. And we did a calculation statistically and fitted the data. And you can see the, the, the uh, empty uh, columns are what we actually measure. The thick dark line, the black line, is what we predicted, and the dotted line is the upper level of the prediction, so that we were able then to correlate 
extremely well these relationships. Now, in a world of ever more rapid change, the patterns of disease move across scales, and we have to draw explanations not just from the medical sciences, but we have to bring in space science, oceanography, um, limnology, ecology, as well as clinical medicine. Global epidemics, for example, the Gopi Desert, um, during the very heavy windy period, that brown dust sweeps off the Gobi Desert. It moves over the Mediterranean and it moves across the western United States to the east. It carries with it microorganisms, um, pathogenic fungi, bacteria, and viruses. We've never really considered this kind of global transfer of pathogens. And we have to in an era of bioterrorism because, in fact, we need to be able to discern the difference between the naturally occurring epidemics and those that are introduced by terrorists. And if we don't have an understanding of how these pathogenic organisms are spread in nature, then we are not going to be able to either predict, control, or prevent the spread when there's a malevolent, deliberate introduction of a pathogen. So, I've discussed with you tonight some infectious diseases with very distinctive biographies. And each of them has a complex and still somewhat, somewhat mysterious relationship to the environment. I believe that many human pathogens are going to reveal the similar complexity that I've described for cholera. And we're going to have new paradigms and new tools to probe infectious disease. In a time that we live in, when people, pathogens, and invading pests travel around the world through both natural and man-made beings, purposefully and unintended. We can no longer circumscribe the dynamics of an infectious disease with a nice, neat, orderly framework and expect to contain and really understand its complexity. In this world we live in, which is ever rapidly changing, the patterns of disease expand across scales. The disease in Africa lands on our doorstep within a flight of an airplane. And so our explanations of disease depend on biological, physical, and social science. For the first time, we can begin to integrate the complexity of all these patterns. If we step out of the old paradigms and we explore the new dimensions, in an era of bioterrorism, we need to understand the patterns of infectious disease and their relationship with the environment so that we can build predictive models. And if we're able to do that, I think we'll have the tools to thwart even the most sophisticated bioterrorists. And finally, the most important ingredient of all is an informed public. Knowledge shared is the most powerful tool for our times. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes. 
Heating, heating is really the best way to do it. But you see, in, in Peru, you can, you can have a boil water alert. In fact, we did that in 97, 98. They had signs on all the, uh, the lampposts that said, boil water now. But in Bangladesh, there is no fuel. In fact, literally, they collect cow dung and uh, shape and dry it in panties, and that's used as the fuel for cooking. So their simple filtration is very important. Yes, please. Question, does the cold temperature have a reverse effect? Beautiful question. Yes. As a matter of fact, what's very interesting is that the cocoa pods, during the winter, burrow down into the sediment and they go into a diapause, a kind of um, dormancy. And the cholera vibrio are associated with them, as I told you. And they go into this dormant state themselves. And so during, in very cold temperatures, the nucleos do go into a kind of stasis. They hunker down, they don't divide, they metabolize very, very little. It's measurable. And then when the temperature changes, then they go into a vegetative state and begin to rapidly reproduce. Well, that's a problem. The question is, can we limit it by freezing? Well, that's a problem because ice cubes, uh, not pure water, is one of the biggest causes of diarrheal disease, particularly for tourists who travel to the uh, developing countries. So it goes into a dormant stage, but it doesn't kill it. There are microphones up here if you come forward to answer your question so everyone can hear. You can share. Well, the question is, um, you know, when with the ability of this bacterium to go into a dormant stage, is that something special that accounts for its being dispersed? This, this dormancy turns out to occur for most waterborne pathogens. It occurs in Campylobacter. And by the way, I didn't mention Helicobacter pylori. That's another waterborne disease. Eighty percent of the children in Bangladesh have been infected with Helicobacter. That's a, an organism that causes stomach ulcers. In the developing countries, for little kids under the age of five, it causes uncontrolled bleeding, and they die. In the developing countries, like the United States, we end up sort of living with it, but it leads to stomach cancer. So it's both developing in a developed country, um, um, one or more disease. But there are many, most of them, Legionella goes non comfortable into the storage stage, E. coli does, Salmonella, Shigella. So it seems to be those organisms that do not derive from soil, but spend most of their time in water, go into this kind of dormant stage. And most of these are gram negative, which is fascinating. There was another hand here somewhere. Yes, please. I was interested in your example with Campylobacter in the UK. And I was wondering whether the species and strains of Campylobacter that are common in chicken and on pork were the same that were being found in water bodies and causing disease in the UK, and therefore whether there's actually ecological pathways say, between chickens and chicken manure and water and people and so on, rather, I think that was what you were pointing to, but yes. I want to fully understand it. The question is, uh, with Campylobacter, uh, are there the, those that come from chicken and pork, are they the same ones in the environment? And the answer is yes, because we really did those experiments about 10 years ago, studying a chicken farm in um, northern Scotland, and very definitely we could detect it in the well water, which it turns out was connected, the groundwater was connected to the river system, 
and quite ironically, the chicken pecking front was upstream. And so it was reaching the groundwater and the wells that were being used to feed the chickens was recirculating the campylobacter. But generally speaking, I mean, that was a unique, and I hope it was unique, but that was one incident. But generally speaking, yes, uh, those that are found in nature are the ones that end up on the chickens that are in the markets. Uh, I'll leave it to my host to decide when enough is enough. <laughs> A question. A lot of the students in the audience are biology majors. I'm a chair of the biology department. And something struck me uh, in the study in which you had a, a part of the population that was filtered water and a part of the population that wasn't. That sort of smacks at the whole bioethics uh, uh, conundrum that we wrestle with. And we talk about it all in our classes, and here's an example of you actually had to wrestle with that. Could you address that? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, that's an important question. Because we were able, once we had analyzed the data, and we were able to show that this works, we now need to go back and do a, another study to see whether other kinds of cloth that are used, let's say, in Rwanda or other countries, other than the sari cloth that's used in Bangladesh, will be as effective. So we will not do the experiments where we have some filter and some don't. Instead, we will go back and do an effectiveness study, which means we will go back and see how many people are still filtering. Of those people still filtering, how many of them do or do not get sick from cholera? So we are simply looking to see how effective we were in delivering that treatment but we're not depriving anybody of treatment. And at the same time, we're doing laboratory experiments to see whether the cloth that women in Africa use as a turban, whether that cloth folded several times, which is available to them with no cost, would be just as effective. I'm curious about the effects of uh, antibiotics being fed to farm animals. Mm -hmm. Do they get destroyed when the meat is cooked? Pardon me, does it work? Do they get destroyed when the meat is cooked? Or does, do they get passed on to humans? Oh, no, the antibiotics in, in meat when it's cooked. That's a good question. Um, for one thing, we use antibiotics much too much. Um, we Chickens are fed massive amounts of antibiotics. Uh, fish are farm reared with tons of antibiotics being used. In fact, in Norway, they did a wonderful experiment showing that if they introduced a vaccine against the major diseases from the fish, they could reduce the amount of antibiotics used by the plants. That promiscuous use of antibiotics is leading to the subject of another lecture, which is increasing drug resistance and depriving of ourselves of the one tool that's so very important in that set of ARs because the incidence of resistance has shot way up. And we now have only a few drugs left in experiments to be able to use to treat disease. Cooking destroys some antibiotics, but not all. I think there may be somebody in the audience who might even be able to amplify that. I want to. Uh Thank Dr. Caldwell for joining us here tonight on what's obviously a very important, critical topic, moment in the politics and in the biocomplexity of the world. If you join me again, thank Dr. Caldwell.